My name is Rene Williams. I'm an assistant professor at the Molecular Photonics Group at the University of Amsterdam. And today we will discuss photon used electron transfer and the classical Marcus theory. We will talk about the Gibbs energy for electron transfer, about the solvent and the internal reorganization energy, as well as the electronic coupling. And we will see how the barrier to electron transfer, how this changes as the driving force and reorganization energy, how as they are modified. We have two species, like an electron donor, electron acceptor, an electron rich pre species and an electron poor species. Then in principle with light, we can have electron transfer and we can create the charged transfer state which consists of the radical cation of the donor and the radical anion of the acceptor. So um, you can wonder, uh, when does this occur? Is it difficult? And what is needed for that? Uh, well, that is basically, altogether that is in the theory of electron transfer that was developed by, uh, by Marcus. He got the Nobel Prize for it. So the first thing, is of course that there should be a driving force. The, sh the, the process should be thermodynamically favorable. Furthermore, if you want to induce this process, then it, this one, the black arrow has to be faster than the red arrow. So it has to compete with the intrinsic decay. So these are two simple requirements. Now, can we estimate this driving force? Yeah, that is, uh, that is doable. Um, so if you start with two neutral molecules, then you can use the redox potentials. You have to think about uh, the interaction of the charges, the Coulomb interactions. There also can be uh, some uh, solvation. And of course, if you excite one of them, that will also have, you have an extra energy input. Um, so uh, basically, uh, either if you use the ionization potentials or the electron affinities. Uh, so if you go, if you take one electron of the donor, you get into this state, then you have the D plus plus point and an electron. If this electron goes on to the acceptor, then you get here. So in that way, just by using the, the redox data of the donor and acceptor, you can get an estimate of the charge transfer state level by using either ionization potential or uh, redox data. Now, what are, um, what are electron rich? What are electron poor species? Well, here you see, for instance, uh, an aromatic unit with methoxy groups that is electron rich. If there are electron withdrawing groups like cyano groups, that makes it electron poor. Also here we have, for instance, uh, dimethyl aniline that is also a very electron rich species so you can think about that here we have osmium three so that's also electron poor so we if we use the the redox data then we can, can use that to estimate the the delta g the driving force for the reaction so um the donor should be easy to lose an electron for the acceptor it should be easy to take up an electron a low Oxidation potential, low reduction potential makes them a good donor, a good acceptor. Um, so, of course, here we have also the excitation energy. Yeah? If you excite one of them, then you're putting extra energy into the system to attain this state. And um, if you have, okay, so you measure your redox data with electrochemistry you measure it in a specific solvent. So if you're using a different solvent, then you, uh, you have to correct for that or uh, do the electrochemistry in another solvent. We'll get to that. Uh, there's also, of course, yeah, so you're, uh, you're starting, usually you're starting with two neutral fragments and you're crea creating two charged fragments. So you have a Coulomb interaction. So that's just, uh, the product of the charge is the dielectric constant and plays a big role and the distance. So here you see that um, 
the more polar the solvent, the lower this uh, Coulomb energy gain is. Yeah, so for uh, a non-polar solvent, you have a much stronger Coulombic interaction because it is not so much solvated. So the polarity of the solvent is important for the Coulomb factor and also for the redox data. So um, if you have measured your electrochemistry in one solvent, usually it's a polar solvent like DMF or acetonitrile. So if you want to measure the properties in a different solvent, then you have this correction term here. So it is the, the polar is then the one in which you did the electrochemistry. And it is, uh, well, a little bit like a Coulomb uh, correction. So that is the redox data. The correction, if, you do, if you're measuring in a solvent different from your electrochemistry, and then we have a Coulomb term. And uh, okay, this term can, can be quite substantial. And eh? you can imagine that uh, if you want to do electrochemistry in uh, acetonitrile, it is much more easy than if you want to do it in uh, cyclohexane because you don't have solvation and because it's non-power solvent. So uh, the energy difference is quite substantial. And also it is very much influenced by the, the size of the ions. So that is one thing that is the driving force, the delta G. So how much is this going down? How much is the product down relative to the starting point? So there are a few other aspects. And uh, you, have, you probably know that uh, this theory is in the textbooks, like in physical chemistry of Atkins. But so next to the driving force, we also have the reorganization energy. So this is the reorganization energy. And um, okay, it is defined as the energy that is needed to distort one state to the equilibrium geometry of the other state. And so it is, if you go from here to this point, it's this energy. So it is the energy that is related to uh, nuclear, the change of nuclear coordinates of the starting state and the product state. And so together, there then also is here the barrier, eh? so the activation energy. Mm, yeah. So we have, uh, we have a driving force. Now the, the reorganization energy that actually consists of an internal part. So if you go from, let's say, a neutral molecule to a radical cation, then the nuclear coordinates, they, they can change a bit. For instance, they can, the molecule can expand a little bit. So there's a change of nuclear coordinates. And the energy related to that, that is the internal reorganization energy. There's also the solvent reorganization energy. So uh, that's also called the outer sphere reorganization energy. So that's due to the solvent. And uh, so the more, okay, that, that's influenced by the solvent. So this is uh, a very important contribution from also from, from Marcus about uh, the reorganization energy, the outer sphere reorganization energy. It is basically um, based on uh, electrostatic. So it's like a classical model, but the reorganization energy, so it relates to the, uh, the, the radii of the ions, of the radical cation and the radical anion, the distance, the refractive index, and the dielectric constant. So this is the expression that uh, Marcus developed for this reorganization energy. And um, well, if you, uh, there's actually, there's one very interesting talk uh, of Marcus where he explains that uh, uh, at that time, they looked especially at the radioisotopes and they had strange effects on uh, product, product ratios depending on the ions. And they actually, they did uh, like precipitation, so it was very crude. And so, 
Uh, another Nobel Prize winner, Libby, Libby, you know, may know from the carbon dating. He had uh, some paper about this, but Marcus realized it was not correct, and then he continued with it. So this radii, you can actually estimate them quite reasonable by using the density and the molecular weight. So you say, okay, the molecule is a sphere. We take the volume of a sphere and that radius of that, and we uh, correlate it to the molar volume which you can get from the molar mass and the density. So in that way, you can uh, make a very, uh, you can make an estimation of this reorganization energy based on uh, just the, the density and the molar mass and the distance, the distance between the two units and the dielectric constant of the medium. That's also uh, important. So that is the reorganization energy. And, uh, Indeed, the, the lapta becomes, the solvent, solvent reorganization becomes stronger if you increase the distance, and it also becomes stronger if you increase the dielectric constant because then the, the solvent is more polar, so it will react more to the charges. And if the distance is larger, then basically there is more space for the solvent molecules to rearrange on the, on the charges that are created. Um, so in a very non-polar solvent, the solvent reorganization energy is very small. Uh, it can be less than a tenth of an uh, electron volt. Um, so this solvent reorganization energy, it is related to the uh, solvent coordinates. So in what respect do the, does the solvent change position or rotating? A relative if you create this charge central state and so that is basically depicted here so this is the donor acceptor system in its neutral state these here are the solvent molecules so if we excite them then uh, we get the charge central state and um, the solvent molecules uh, instantly because of frank condon excitation they cannot react but then after a uh, short period, these molecules, they will orient. They will orient themselves towards this dipole that is created. So the energy that is related to this orientation of the molecules and uh, maybe some movement of the molecules with respect to the creation of this charge central state, that is the lambda, the solvent reorganization energy. Now, the internal reorganization, you can make a very uh, good estimate of that if you have two very particular aspects. That is, if you can have a direct optical transition to the charge transfer state. So that means that you have a charge transfer absorption, a charge transfer absorption band, as well as charge transfer emission. So the charge transfer emission that is like exiplex emission. Yeah? So we have seen that with pyrene and with aniline. So the, the charge transfer state, it uh, can have a radiative recombination. So that is this, this emission here, it's the structuralist band. So the energy difference between the charge transfer absorption and the charge transfer emission, that is two times the lambda internal. So that is sort of depicted here. And then this is the, this is the absorption, this is the emission, and the energy difference between the two is two times the internal lambda. You can also calculate that with uh, quantum chemical programs. Um, okay, back in uh, 1993, we estimated the internal reorganization energy of uh, C60 aniline uh, combination from these kind of data, and that was uh, 0.3 electron volts. And uh, a couple of years ago, they calculated it with uh, DFT over TDDFT, and it was actually the same value. So that fits very nicely. It can fit very nicely. So that is the internal reorganization energy to what respects do the fragments of the donor receptor itself 
the internal coordinates, how do they change? Um, so we have- sorry, could, could you go one slide back? Sure. Uh, what, uh, sorry, another one. Mm -hmm. um, what, is this now estimated from the Stoke shift? No, or no, not? no. I, I, I find it difficult to see in the spectra. Are you estimated? Um, yeah, so um, like, uh, we have seen the excimer emission of pyrene. We have seen the exiplex emission. So a charge transfer state can uh, emit. And so this emission, that is the emission from the charge transfer state. So this is the peak. Now the other side, that is charge transfer absorption. So, um, well, if you take the scheme for pyrene, eh, you have this uh, repulsive energy surface. Now, sometimes in the ground state, the molecules already interact, especially at high, uh, if you increase the concentration, you can see it. So then there's a little dip there. So that implies that you can have a direct optical transition from the ground state to the charge transfer state. We call that the charge transfer absorption band. So it is usually quite weak. It is not present in the separate components, but only in the mixture. And it, uh, its intensity increases if you increase the concentrations. It can also be present in, um, in covalent molecules, a charge transfer absorption band. So it's an, uh, it is an absorptive transition directly into the charge transfer state. But um, yeah, like this, this um, absorption of the ground state CT complex is very broad. So where do you uh, exactly determine this energy difference? Because yeah, is, uh, um, maybe this, this example is not ideal, but uh, normally you do see like a certain maximum. Okay, yeah. Now, I don't know exactly um, how people determine this exactly, but it's probably right in the middle. Here it's also in the middle. Uh, you're, uh, the, I have seen examples where there is more a, a, real, a real maximum in the charge center absorption. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It makes it easier. Yeah. All um, right, thank you. It gives you also an estimate. Eh? So this is half an electron volt. That is two lambda. So then you have uh, 0.255 electron volt as the internal regularization energy. So that is quite small, but that is uh, in the order of magnitude that it uh, can be. All right. So that, yeah. So we have discussed the delta G. We have discussed the regularization energy. Now can we say something about the rate? And so the, the Marx theory, this is the, basically the Marx expression of the rate. So it contains all the parameters. But the one that we have not discussed yet is the electronic coupling. And so we, here we have the driving force, here we have the reorganization energy, but you have to go from one state into the other. So these states have to mix, they have to couple. And this is the V or the VDA. So it's the electronic coupling between the two units. And for the rest, it's uh, the constants, the lambda, the delta G in there. So what about this electronic coupling? It is the overlap of the electronic wave functions of the donor and the acceptor. So there has to be um, well some kind of overlap between the orbitals of the electronic orbitals for this uh, electronic coupling to be present. So it's the electronic coupling. And uh, okay, you can try to think about it hopefully better if you look at this particular molecule so that is something that uh, we have calculated the orbitals and for instance here this is the charge separation so it is the homo of the acceptor or the excited acceptor and the homo of the donor these orbitals they have to overlap they have to there has to be electronic coupling for the process to occur. Now here you see the 
the homo of the donor. So you see, it looks quite weird, but it extends into these uh, sigma bonds that are attached to this, uh, and it is an aniline. Eh? It's an aniline in the sigma bonds, and here is this fluorine. And here is the homo of the acceptor. So especially here, you see, okay, it is of course a very, very weird orbital because of uh, it's a spherical pi system. And therefore it can easily interact with these covalent uh, saturated bonds that are attached. And here you see that the, um, even at the other side of the molecule, there's a very, very little uh, orbital coefficients. So the overlap of this orbital with this one in space, that is the electronic coupling as a visualization. And you can maybe also understand that for the home of the acceptor, the electronic coupling is much better than for the LUMO. And the LUMO is related to the charge recombination process. And the ratio here is about uh, thousands of the charge uh, separation, charge recombination. So this gives you uh, hopefully some kind of uh, feeling for the electronic coupling. So it is really the overlap of uh, electronic wave functions of the donor and the acceptor. Um, this overlap or this interaction energy, this V, it does not have to be very, very large. And uh, yeah, if you have, uh, okay, 13 wave numbers, so that is uh, quite small energy that is enough to give fast electron transfer. Uh, for this, the other system that I just showed you, we determined uh, 40 wave numbers and a rate of 10 to the 9, so in the nanosecond time scale. But of course, the distance is very large. So uh, this is the magnitude of the electronic coupling that you can think about. And uh, this gives you the third important parameter in this rate equation. So next to the delta G, the driving force and the regularization energy, we have the electronic coupling. And uh, okay, it can be quite small. I so just have a quick question. Yes. Um, on the slides with this, um, where you showed the three examples uh, um, for electron transfer, the yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, there was an R E. What does that mean? Uh, the edge-to-edge -edge distance. So um, there are two uh, distances that you can uh, that you can think about. That's the center to center. So let's say the the center of this chromophore and the center of that chromophore, or the edge-to-edge. -edge. And so the edge-to-edge -edge distance is uh, is more fair because if your molecule is extremely big and the other one also, then the center to center distance is very large. But the edge to edge distance is very small. Wait, wait, what, what is the edge to edge in this example? Uh, so the, this is the, let's say this is the edge of the, of the system and that is the, the other edge. Oh, like you, the edge is defined for donor and acceptor. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. Ah, okay, yeah. So there, are, there are two distances that are used in this whole uh, yeah. theory, especially okay. the distance dependence. It's also in the Fuster theory, we also have the, a distance which is also center to center but if you look at the uh, distance dependence of electron transfer then edge to edge is more fair it's a better yeah. description all right thanks i also have a question oh can, can i yeah. about the next slide yeah um so i'm a bit confused but maybe i should have known this before but i'm following a course organic photovoltaics and then the charge transfer is from the uh, LUMO from the donor to the LUMO from the acceptor. And that's what I also call the driving energy. So um, but. It, uh, it actually, uh, it has come across in the energy transfer uh, bits. Yeah? So uh, in principle, you can have um, electron transfer that goes from from LUMO to LUMO. But yeah, and then LUMO is lower. Yeah. From HOMO to HOMO. In this case, um, this 
is the chart separation step. So it is, uh, okay, um, sometimes people call this a hole transfer eh, because the, you basically move a hole, but of mm -hmm. course, that's your reference point. It, uh, it, uh, you can also say it's an electron transfer because the electron moves. And uh, so in this case, you excite the acceptor and the charge separation is uh, a homo-homo interaction. But there are other systems in which you, let's say uh, you excite the donor and then it's a lumo-lumo interaction, the, the, the electron transfer. So there are two possibilities. Okay, and is there like, and can it be both when we discuss this or is it now mainly uh, this homo, depends, homo transfer? Depends on your system. It depends on your system. Yeah, which, uh, if you excite your donor, then you have a lumo-lumo interaction. Yeah, because uh, the electron goes to the acceptor, so you want to create uh, a state with three electrons in it, a radical anion. But if you excite the donor, then this electron has to move to the acceptor. So it depends on which uh, molecule you excite. And in organic photovoltaics, it is basically always the, the polymer that you excite, and that is the donor. So that makes sense. And of course, uh, so in uh, organic photovoltaics, they often talk about the, the lumo lumo offset or the the offset of the orbitals, and that is also a measure, but um, if you use the redox chemistry and the driving force that is uh, based on all these different quantities, that is, uh, well, I would say a better description or more appropriate, because there are also other effects that play a role. Does this help you? Yes, a bit, thank you. And yeah, this is uh, a frontier molecular orbital description yeah, that you can always try to use for these kinds of processes. Yeah, I, I also have a quick question. Yeah. Is, is there a point in which uh, somehow el electron repulsion forces play a role with these distances between uh, the two centers? Um, it's... And you mean that then they, they prevent the transfer or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure I'm thinking about it, but I, I don't know if. Uh... Uh, so basically um, that implies uh, that there's the exchange integral. Are you referring to the exchange integral? Uh, yeah, I think so. So um, it is possible that uh, this is uh, this here is the charge strength state, uh -huh. and uh, this is a singlet. It can yeah. actually it can uh, transform into a triplet charge strength state, and then of course the exchange integral it plays a role. The J is then the difference between the singlet charge transfer and the triplet charge strength state, and that is uh, well. I'm not sure if you mean that, but... Uh... Mm, yeah, also because in principle, uh, the donor should be more electron rich, no, at the beginning. Yes. And then uh, when, they, when it transfers the, the electron to the acceptor, then uh, they, both their electron uh, densities change. Yes. And then at this point, I don't know if, uh, if they are too close, also this uh, more equal electron density, could affect uh, somehow the efficiency of the process? Um, usually, no, there, I, I don't think that uh, it's likely that they're too close because also the, the charges, they will attract each other. So they can actually, they can approach each other better in the charge transfer states if you compare them to the neutral molecules, I would say, because okay. they're, uh, Coulomb attraction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that I have. Yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so the an important part of the, of the Marx theory is that you have this uh, activation energy 
and there's like an interplay of the driving force and the reorganization energy that uh, describes the activation energy. So it is, yeah, you have to go over this hill, over this crossing point to get to the other states. So the Marcus theory, it implies that there is a normal region where the driving force is relatively small compared to the regularization energy. There's an optimal region in which you have uh, basically direct transition from this state to the other. There's no barrier. So the rate is as fast as possible. And then there's this inverted region. So then the regularization energy is relatively small compared to the delta G. And uh, so here you have a barrier. So there's temperature dependence. It is uh, slower. Here it goes faster. And here it goes slower again because you have to go up this little hill there. That is the inverted region. So the Marcus theory, it implies that if you increase the driving force, it becomes faster and faster. But then if you increase it more, it becomes slower. And that is basically counterintuitive because you always expect to go things to go faster if they go more downhill. Um, so there are basically um, two things you can do if you want to study this process. And one of them is changing the delta G. So, um, well, this is a visualization. The delta G is in black, the barrier in red, and the lambda, the reorganization energy, is in blue. And now we shift this curve, we shift it down. So you see that the, the process is about to become possible. And you see that the barrier becomes smaller, but the reorganization energy chase stays the same. And so now, uh, the, you're in the optimal region and now you go into the inverted region and you see that the barrier becomes stronger and the more down you go the more higher the barrier becomes so this is changing the driving force the effect of changing the driving force so um, you can of course basically you see that you're only shifting this function down and uh, it is actually, it is quite difficult to only change the driving force because a lot of the times you also change the reorganization energy together with it. But anyway, oh, yeah. so here we have the normal region and we have a barrier. The lambda is larger than a delta G. And so the rate will go down if you lower the temperature. This is the normal region. Okay, we have a barrier. We go up there. This is what we call a degenerate electron transfer. So if the two states are equal in energy, then the, the Marcus equation implies that uh, the activation energy is lambda divided by four. That comes okay from the Marcus theory. If the delta G is zero, then the barrier is uh, lambda squared divided by four lambda, so it's lambda divided by four. And, and of course, the, the nice thing about the classical Marcus theory is that it is based on quadratic functions, so the mathematics is not really that difficult. Uh, if there are more questions, uh, let me know. I saw a face appearing, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, I have, I have one. Yeah. Uh, so is there a point in the Marcus inverted region in which uh, charge recombination is uh, fully prevented because of... Yeah, that, that uh, um, you, uh, okay, if you take the classical Marcus, then you indeed can get predictions that a lifetime lives, uh, a charge transfer state lives for seconds, years, centuries. <laughs> but that is the the limit of the classical Marcus. So then you have to go to the semi-classical and then this nuclear tunneling, this overlap of vibrational wave function becomes a exactly. role. And so uh, the classical Marcus theory, it works uh, very well for charge separation. If there's a little barrier or if you're in the optimal region, then it works uh, very, very nicely. But for charge recombination, there it has uh, problems and that's why they uh, try to improve the theory. Yeah. But indeed, it is uh, on paper, you can uh, expect that, but you can't measure it. it does, it's not realistic. 
Okay, nice, thank you. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so this is the, uh, so intervalence bands, they are also like degenerate and you have the, the starting point and the end point has the same energy. We will also get back to that. Here we have the, the optimal region. So uh, the, the lambda and the delta G is, are equal in magnitude. The, the, the functions, they cross each other in the lowest point. So you go directly from one to the other. Activation energy is zero. And so here the rate is only expressed as the electronic coupling and the reorganization energy is here. So this is like the maximum rate that you can attain. And that is usually, uh, okay, 10 to the power 13 per second or something like that, in that magnitude, it can be. So then there's this funny inverted region when you have a small lambda and a large delta G. And so the inverted region implies that if you want to go to the product, you have to go all the way up. Well, you have to go all the way up here to this green area and then go into the product well. Now this is not, uh, not realistic. You also see that the, the barrier here is very thin compared to the normal region. But this is the picture of the classical Marcus in the inverted region. Can you maybe explain the charge recombination? Um, the previous question from Said. Um, I don't know, really understand how I could see from these graphs that you would have these, this charge recombination. So what do these graphs imply? Okay, so uh, this actually, um, so here you have, uh, this is the, this curve is the excited donor and the acceptor. Then you can have charge separation over this hill. This is the charge transfer state. So it's the plus point, the minus point. Now this state, it will, or it can go back to the ground state. And this here is the ground state again. So you have to go from this purple one into the black one here. So this, uh, okay, actually the excitation is missing. This would be the excitation. So charge recombination is just going from the charge central state back to the ground state. The electron jumps back, just like uh, um, here. This is the charge recombination, the electron going back, creating the original state. But how does it come more impossible with the classical Marcus theory that it is like uh, not sufficient anymore? Um, yeah, so that's the, that is here. So um, according to this equation, this barrier is uh, basically much higher. And if you measure experimentally, then it doesn't fit your data. So the charge recombination does usually not follow the classical Marcus theory because the, the recombination is faster. It, it is not, the activation energy is not so large that it is this energy difference, practically, experimentally. Mm. Mm, I don't really so, understand uh, it. The prediction of the classical Marcus theory that uh, uh, it predicts a very slow charge recombination in the inverted region with a very high barrier because you have to go all the way up uh, here and um, it overestimates this barrier. It's too high in practice. It doesn't work. It doesn't fit the data. It doesn't fit the experiments. Okay. So it means that uh, in the inverted region, the, the classical Marcus does not work very well. And that, um, well, that you, you, can, you can basically observe that from your, from your measurements. It doesn't fit your data, but the, the, the normal region and the optimal region that fits, then you can basically use it to explain your data quite well. Um, yeah, so this is uh, something that we saw before, and this is then the inverted region with this, with this barrier. Um, here, we now change the lambda. So now we have a similar situation. We have uh, black is the driving force. Red here is the barrier. 
and in blue is the reorganization energy. So we're going to change the reorganization energy. That means that we shift one of the functions towards the nuclear coordinates of the other. So you see that uh, reorganization energy becomes smaller and smaller. Now we are in the optimal region and now we are in the inverted region. So in, in, in the inverted region, you see that the barrier goes up and becomes, uh, well, even here, it becomes extremely high. And so in practice, it overestimates this. But uh, yeah, this is uh, just showing the effect of changing the reorganization energy only, keeping the driving force constant. So um, about 20 years after Marcus came up with his theory, yeah? I have another quick question. Uh, is, is there a point in which if the organization energy is really low, like uh, the, the geometrical coordinate doesn't change too much, and the driving force is really large in the charge separation state, so Marcus inverted region, can it become like so high driving force that then the potential energy surface of the charge separation state overlaps with the charge, uh, yeah, with the ground state, let's say, yes. without going through the, uh, but, but then it would be a diff different processes, no? Maybe just. Uh, yeah, so, um... Okay, in the beginning, we said that we can have photo induced electric transfer if there's a driving force and you excite and you have your, your, your charge central state should be lower than the excited states. But uh -huh. if your central state is lower than the ground state, then you just then end you have up in a thermal the process. Like with, uh, if you take sodium and uh, chlorine gas, CL2, yeah, they, have, like, they form an ion pair in the ground state. It's like a thermal reaction, an exothermal reaction, even. So if okay. your charge transfer state is below your ground state, then mm -hmm. you, have, you don't need light. You don't have fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just have a, a thermal reaction, like a redox reaction. That yeah, can yeah. happen. And uh, it yeah, can yeah, be that your donor is too good. Or if your donor, um, if it reacts, if the radical cation is not stable, then you can form the radical anion in, 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 in a stable way. But then the difference is only that in these cases the reorganization energy is overcome thermally and not photochemically. Yeah, 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 I would say so, yeah. Okay, yeah, <laughs> okay, thank you. So um, let's say about 20 years after Marcus came up with his theory, with, uh, about the inverted region especially, uh, then people were able to measure it and they used uh, this kind of molecule. So this is like a steroid. This is a biphenyl, and they change the acceptor. They only change the acceptor, making it uh, stronger and stronger, going into quinones with uh, chloroatoms with electron withdrawing groups. Uh, and they actually used a charge shift reaction. Um, oh, yeah, so the, there's more. There's another picture there. They pump an electron on the biphenyl, and they see how fast it disappears. So it is done with pulse radiolysis, it's quite special. And uh, also um, these rates are actually quite low. So if you do a photo induced electron transfer and your lifetime only lives a few nanoseconds, then you can never measure these rates. But basically uh, what Kloss and Miller did is they measured the rate of electron transfer as a function of driving force for these uh, different molecules. And then they saw that the rate goes up and up and up, and then it goes down again. So this is the first experimental observation, clear observation of the inverted region, of the Marcus inverted region. And it was essential. It was very important that this happened to make this theory uh, develop. And uh, of course, if, if nobody was able to, to prove his theory, he would not have gotten the Nobel Prize, I think, for it. But they did. So, um, yeah. can, can I ask a question about this? Uh, the, um, wh what's the order of magnitude of the difference in lambda between these uh, different uh, uh, substituents? Because there, there should be a difference, but it shouldn't be too large to influence this experiment. So 
because especially if you add carbonyl groups to this, I can imagine that there would be some change in reorganization energy. But uh, uh, is that is that really significant or not? No, it is not significant. So um, uh, basically, because they do a charge shift reaction um, that makes it uh, less changed. Because uh, and uh, okay, basically, okay, the fit of this curve, also the semi-classical fit, that assumes one lambda, one reorganization energy, and it's all in the same solvent. So the solvent reorganization does not change. The internal reorganization, well, they assume that it does not change. And uh, well, as you may realize, this data set uh, that is uh, enormous uh, attention for it. So especially in the last five years, there have been uh, um, like five or six computational papers about these molecules. And so they calculate with uh, TDDFT with a high end calculations about the reorganization energy and the vibrations that play a role here. But so uh, people find that the reorganization energy does not change a lot. So it is uh, basically constant within this series. Okay, yeah, thanks. But it is, uh, it is an important aspect. Um, so the trick that Klaus and Miller did with this pulse radiolysis is that they could stay in one solvent and change the driving force by only changing the acceptor. Now, normally, if you do photo-induced electron transfer, uh, it is difficult to, uh, it's more difficult to change only one parameter. And what people do a lot is to look at solvent effects. And so, of course, if you, if you have a charged central state that is in a polar solvent, it becomes lower because it's stabilized. So in that way, you can also study these kind of processes. And here we see for this kind of molecule, uh, the effect of changing the solvent. So the dielectric constant starts at 2.4, then we go to three to five, at six it actually becomes possible, the process, and at uh, 25 it is uh, a nanosecond time scale. So yeah, we see that it goes down to three, so the process is still not exergonic, it cannot happen. Now we are at five, so there, the charge central state is lower than the starting state, but the rate, the predicted rate, is actually still too slow to compete with the intrinsic decay. So then we go to six, so at six then uh, we have a driving force, we have a smaller barrier, and this 10 to the ninth, one time 10 to the ninth, is basically uh, compare, comparative to the intrinsic decay of the C60 unit. So now you have like 50-50. Uh, it is uh, giving charge transfer, but not a uh, 100%, only 50%. So now we go down even more, so you see that the rate becomes faster. And here we have, uh, this is the dielectric constant of benzonitrile. So looking at the temperature dependence and the transit absorption, this uh, barrier and this rate have been determined and they now are fitted into the classical Marcus model. So it works, uh, it can work very nicely. So what happens precisely when you uh, change this dia uh, dielectric uh, constant of your solvent with your molecule? Do you change the, the donor and acceptor uh, regions? Or? Oh, so the, if you have a donor acceptor system and you, uh, change the solvent, then uh, you change the dielectric constant and the refractive index, and they are within the, the equations of the driving force, but also of the reorganization energy. So if you take a donor acceptor system in different solvents, then you can increase the driving force, make it more uh, exergonic, but you will also change the reorganization energy. So there's a the product, well, it shifts a little bit to the right because of the solvent effect on the realization energy. So this um, implies that if you want to 
Okay, it is, you can understand that Kloss and Miller did very clever tricks by using pulse radiolysis because then uh, you don't have this change of the solvent reorganization in the process. But most studies, they are using uh, solvent effects on charge transfer systems. And then you have the, the increase of the driving force, but also the increase of the reorganization energy. So you change them both. And okay, that, yeah. That is what we basically show here. You see that the blue line, the blue line also uh, becomes larger if you go to higher uh, dielectric constants. Uh, so the the inverted region. Uh, can I ask a question with the last uh, slide? Sure. With this one? Yeah. So, for instance, in this case, can we get the same, uh, yeah, like the same rates of reaction, uh, regardless if we have a lower driving force, if we change the excitation wavelength, so to overcome the vibrational. Uh, but yeah, like to go to this higher vibrational state of the excited state, where it already overlaps with the with the charge separation state. Um, so the if you use uh, high energy lights, then you lose energy basically until you get to the lowest state of that chromophore, and this is the energy that can be used. So it's like the zero zero energy that is used for the Electron transfer. Okay, okay. So it will, anyways, go to the yeah, Kasha's uh, rule thing. Exactly. Yeah, that is usually what happens. Uh, yeah. There are examples that uh, the S two gives some charge separation. Ah, so okay, it's okay. possible, but it's not very common. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the inverted region is basically. Uh, this going from the charge transfer state here back to the ground state, it can be uh, a radiationless process, radiationless decay, and that brings you to the energy gap law and this uh, overlap of vibrational wave functions. So we have the inverted region, we have the optimal region, and we can wonder how this uh, electron moves from one side to the other. And yeah, so this represents basically what is happening. So you have a donor acceptor system, you excite it, you first get into the uh, excited state. So this is basically the energy that can be lost eh, by uh, Kasha's rule. So then you have the lowest level of the excited state of one of them. Then you have to go over this barrier. Here we have the, the electronic coupling. And then we get into the product state, in the final state. So that is uh, the model. There are basically three positions that are important. And you can describe these positions like this. So the first one, eh, you excite, you get here. Now at this point, the energy difference between the initial state and the final state, the energy difference at the same nuclear coordinates is quite big. You are in a position where the electron is basically only on uh, one side, but uh, as we saw with these funny looking orbitals that extend all the way to the other side, there must be electronic coupling for the process to happen. So uh, there, okay, it is like the orbital is extending partly or totally to the other side of the molecule. So then we have to go uh, up this barrier and uh, we have to go up this hill in the normal region. And here we are at the crossing point. So now this energy difference it has become zero. So it is a little bit like in an uh, orbital interaction scheme. If the energy difference is uh, large, the coupling or the, the mixing is small. If the energy difference is the same, then there's a, a lot of energy gain. So a similar picture can be applied here. Here you are at the zero energy difference, so it's easy to go to the other side. Now this position, uh, Marcus calls it that the electron is formally transferred there. But if you think about it a bit more, then you can say that there's like a 50-50% of finding the electron on one side or the other. Right? The electron is in an orbital. So here, this, uh, you go over the barrier and then you go into the product side. And if you are here in, at, the, at the product well, 
Then again, the energy difference is very large. The electron is basically uh, only on this side, but if there's still a charge recombination, then there's still also electronic coupling. So in this way, you can view this electron transfer as a travel across a potential energy curve or a landscape, which is accompanied by a, a change of uh, orbital coefficients on the donor and acceptor. They, they uh, become, here they become smaller and here they become larger. So that is how you can view this whole process. And uh, Bernd, Bernd Ensing, he has made very nice uh, calculations about these kind of processes that show this exactly. So here the electron is on one side and here the electron is like 50-50 and here the electron is on the other side basically. So uh, this is uh, a paper about uh, ruthenium 2 plus, ruthenium 3 plus, so it's like an intervalence uh, electron transfer and that shows this evolution of uh, orbital coefficients. I will see if I can get it. Uh, do you still see the screen? Yeah. So you see that it uh, actually you see how the electron sort of jumps to the other side. It's like a stochastic process. You see also the solvent uh, the solvent is moving but basically you see that the, the elect there, there's, a position, there's a situation which is like a transition state where there's like a 50-50% of finding the electron on one side or the other. And uh, this is thermal electron transfer between two ions. And you see that the, even the solvent coordinates, they play a role. Eh? So the water molecules are here coordinate on the, on the ion and they uh, even interact. They have some coefficients sometimes. So that is uh, how you can think about this process. This is the paper. Uh, I have a question. Um, it's um, about the slide that shows the orbital contributions. Um, it, it, it looks like the, wait, the delta E is the lambda, right? Or not? Um, no, the... The lambda is um, defined only for the start. So it is, uh, now the, the, the lambda is not the delta E. The delta E is the, the energy difference uh, at one nuclear coordinate of the two states. And so if you are here, um, it's, well, it is similar to the lambda but not exactly because the lambda actually you would have to go from here all the way to this line so it's, it's even a little bit higher and then yeah i was confused delta, because, sorry so the delta e that is depicted here it is only the energy difference between the, the initial and the final state uh, as a function of the transfer process and so um, here, the energy difference is this line. Then you go up this hill. The energy difference between, becomes smaller and smaller between the two states. Here, the energy difference between the two states is zero. And here, it becomes big again. Um, so it's, yeah, what does it represent? It represents that, uh, that the, the electron transfer is actually an isoenergetic process. And so the two levels, on which the electron transfers, they have to be at the same energy uh, for the transfer to happen. And that is showing this delta E. So this is actually, it's based on a, a paper of Marcus, uh, Biophysica Biochimica Acta. And uh, that's where he also uses this delta E as a visualization of the process that uh, it is the energy difference at one nuclear coordinate of the two states. And if you move across this potential energy surface, this energy difference becomes smaller and smaller until it is hydroenergetic, and then the transfer can happen. Yeah, yeah, so the, the mixing is greatest at the crossing point, basically. 
Yeah, the uh, right. Or the now it is it is going to an isoenergetic situation. Um, the electronic coupling actually it in principle does not change there, but it is a little bit like an uh, orbital interaction diagram. It is similar. But okay, so the but the lambda. Uh, that's why I was confused. The lambda for forward and back, that should be the same, right? The reorganization energy. The lambda in this picture does not change. The reorganization oh, energy uh, does not change if you go from here to there to there. That's something in general, right? If you have an electron transfer, that, that the, the lambda defines the electron transfer the one in one way, but also in the other way. Um, no, actually, the... Yeah, it, it is usually, it is assumed that it's the same, but in principle it does not have, to, for the charge recombination, it actually can be different. But uh, this, is, yeah. this is only the charge separate. Ah, okay, charge recombination, but then you go to the ground state. Yeah, then you go to the ground state, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I'm referring to the, just the charge separation back and forth, where it is. Yeah, uh, then it's the same, the it's the same. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So this puts basically everything together. Eh? So uh, the barrier as a function of delta G and lambda, the reorganization energy, the internal and the solvent. The solvent is with this expression. Actually, now it's with the average ionic radius. Uh, you can also determine the barrier by using Arrhenius, and you can determine the driving force by using the, the redox data, the energy of the excitation at a zero zero energy, and then you have uh, a Coulomb term and a correction term if you're measuring in a solvent in which you did not do your electrochemistry. So this is all the aspects that you can look at in the Marcus uh, equation. And so we have the driving force, the regularization energy, the electronic coupling. And as we said before, the Marcus theory, the classical Marcus theory, it works very well in the normal region and in the optimal region. Um, okay, if you, if, you have your, if you have your rate, then you can actually estimate the electronic coupling. But if you don't have your electronic coupling and you don't have a rate, then it is hard to predict uh, a lot. So uh, creating charges in general, creating charges is easier than keeping the charges apart. So having long lived charge separation is actually uh, difficult. And uh, Part of that is because of the inverted region and the tunneling in the inverted region. Uh, so this again, uh, okay, the charge recombination. Uh, so this is the charge, now this is the local excited state, this is the charge transfer state. So the charge recombination is often in the inverted region. So then the classical Marcus predicts a very, very slow charge recombination, but in practice it's actually usually uh, not fitting that model, it is faster. Uh, but uh, basically, if you want to create longer lift charges, then, okay, there's two tricks. You can try to increase this energy gap here, the delta G for the charge recombination. You can try to make the lambda smaller, the solvent reorganization, the internal reorganization, or you can do the trick that the electronic coupling for the back step that that becomes a lot smaller than for the charge separation, the forward reaction. So these are a few aspects that you can play with. Of course, uh, you can also try to mimic nature and do a multi-step reaction. Then you also uh, can get a longer lift charge separated states. So either electron transfer in one go or with the hopping process, that is uh, another option. And of course, nature does that. So um, we have discussed the classical Marcus equation. And now we will 
talk a little bit about this semi-classical approach. Uh, so here we see this, uh, this is this bifetal anion with the electron transfer to the acceptor. So they changed the nature of the acceptor. Uh, Klaus and Miller did that and they studied the rate. So the logarithm of the rate as a function of driving force is here. And this is the inverted region. So um, in the inverted region, uh, the rates are actually faster than fitting this uh, data. And that is because of this overlap of vibrational wave functions. Yeah? So this is the overlap of vibrational wave functions in the normal region. Here it is in the inverted region. And in inverted region, this black area is basically larger. So uh, just like this uh, stuff about the semi-classical markers, eh? we have the Arrhenius equation. If we go to the classical Marcus equation, then uh, this A is expanded into uh, electronic coupling and reorganization energy. The barrier is then a function of the delta G and the lambda. So this is the classical Marcus, but uh, for the rest, it's very similar to the Arrhenius. So in the semi-classical Marcus, you take into account this overlap of vibrational wave functions. So the pre-exponential part remains very similar, only the lambda s is here instead of the lambda. And this here is then a summation of different functions. And here is a vibration. And so just like with pyrene and the forbidden transition, you have uh, fibronic coupling, the vibration plays a role in the electronic transition or in the electronic process. And this s here is the ratio of the internal reorganization and this energy of the vibration. So um, if you go from the classical markers to the semi-classical, you do have uh, a better fit to your charge recombination in the inverted region, but the, uh, the expression becomes, okay, a lot more complex. And it is related, uh, this uh, enhancement of the rate in the inverted region is related to frank condon factor, frank condon weight density of states, uh, now you know that from the frank condon excitation. And so this picture, it visualizes frank condon excitation. So the overlap of this vibrational wave function, it is the strongest if you go to this state, to this level. So it gives the strongest peak. If you go from this level to that one, then the overlap of these vibrational wave functions you, is extremely small. So the transition is extremely weak. So this is Frank Condon excitation. It is also, basically, you project this vibrational wave functions onto the other levels. So you do actually the same in this Frank Condon weight density of states. And so this is the picture that uh, is from a book. Here you see the initial state here. This is then the charge separated states. And then the black area here is the overlap of vibrational wave functions. So this is the frank condon factor, the frank condon weight density of states. And it becomes more important if you go into the inverted region. And that is displayed here. So this black area here is larger than it is in the normal region. So the the rates are faster than the classical Marcus predicts because of overlap of vibrational wave function, for, for nuclear tunneling. People call it nuclear tunneling. So that gives you uh, a little bit of uh, view on the semi-classical. And uh, uh, these vibrations, that's actually quite critical. Usually they are between 300 and 2300 wave numbers. Uh, Kloss and Miller, they always used uh, 1500 wave numbers at the vibration. But these uh, modern calculation papers on these molecules, they are all around 800, 900 wave numbers. So that skeletal vibration of this molecule is important in this transfer process in this uh, special S factor, the one rise factor. Sorry, I have a question uh, regarding the previous uh, slide. This one? Uh, 
maybe you explained it, but why does the um, energy transfer const uh, electron transfer constant become larger f when you take into account the vibrational coupling? It is uh, it is giving extra rate in this region. It it uh, um, okay. So this expression it has the consequence that uh, in the inverted region there is uh, rate is added because of this summation and, uh, and so if you don't take into account the overlap of vibrational wave functions then your rate is lower if you do take it into account then the rate becomes higher because the, the overlap of vibrational wave functions it uh, gives extra transfer Okay, yeah. It is an extra factor, basically. So it adds up to the total summation in your uh, formula. Exactly, yeah. It, it, okay. adds. it adds in that region, especially. Yeah. Um, so we have looked at photon use electron transfer. We have discussed uh, the Gibbs free energy, the regularization energy, electronic coupling. We talked about the normal region, optimal region, and inverted region. And this last bit, we talked about uh, the Frank Condon factor, so this overlap of probational wave functions. Um, so I have to admit that uh, I especially applied the classical Marcus theory in many papers. I only have one paper on the semi classical Marcus uh, theory, together with Eindhoven, with uh, Bram Karsten. So he had everything uh, in a Excel sheet. He put everything on this Ricardius equation in an Excel sheet and that uh, he used to, to calculate uh, these effects. But um, I do have, okay, uh, I have data that cannot be explained with the classical marker. So using the semi-classical is, is needed, especially for charge recombination. And with this, we have presented uh, what we wanted for today. Can I ask a question about the last part? This, um, of course. Um, yeah, I, 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 I understand this uh, uh, that that you need to include vibrations to describe this uh, inverted region, but I don't see mathematically how that uh, vibrational overlap is really incorporated. I do see that there is an exponential term with a vibration in it and that there is an uh, S factor that also kind of incorporates this coupling. But I, I have uh, difficulties in seeing how this really is a, like a typical Frank Condon factor. Like I don't see that there is really overlap in vibrational wave functions. And then you mean here? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah, it is, um, let's put it like this, that the, the this energy, the, the H nu, is like the vibrational spacing. And so uh, how does it fit onto the, the curve and how do, the, the, who the, how do these vibrational states, how do they uh, interact? That is, expressed with this one rise factor. Um, okay, in a way, the, these kind of expressions, they're also used for the energy gap law, for uh, radiationless transitions. So basically, uh, I think what Jortner did is to take uh, his work of the radiationless transitions and, and uh, energy gap law type processes and incorporate it into this uh, Marcus equation. Um, so uh, the, the solvent reorganization is still used classically, but the internal reorganization, that is the one that gives the, the resonance effects with the vibrational wave functions. And, uh, and so if you take m is zero then actually this whole term falls off so if you go from one and you increase it 
then uh, mathematically you can uh, show that um, that the inverted region area is increased in, in rate. And also if you if you go to like 15, then you don't see an effect anymore. So it, it levels off. It's actually funny because it, this also shows that there's the, the zero point energy vibration is not incorporated, actually. Right? For M M is zero, this uh term drops yeah the term drops yeah 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 that is also uh <laughs> okay so I, I have just been playing with mathematica putting in the classical and the semi-classical and then i i find out that okay of course yeah, if you put in zero yeah then then the term vanishes you can understand it basically but if i see this equation i cannot uh find it out immediately and also uh, so what uh, this guy uh, bram from eindhoven he put the whole semi-classical in an excel sheet and I saw he stopped at a certain point. I was also wondering why does he stop at 15? Because then the contributions become smaller and smaller. They, they become negligible. So you don't have to go to infinity. Right. Yeah. You have to go to uh, 10, 15, and then it describes it well. So what, what uh, does this M really mean with going from one to, to 15? It is the summation factor. And so um, it is like, So this is the, let's say, the classical curve. And now uh, for, uh, if you go, if you put one in this M, then you get something like this. But if you increase the M, then uh, it adds up another, uh, another curve next to it, and then another next to it. And then uh, the intensity goes down, but uh, it adds in the inverted region but to a lesser and lesser extent as M increases. And you also explained this in your pre-recorded lecture, but I didn't really understand with increasing your M, uh, indeed what you say that you add up in the amounts of graphs that you get. Uh, can you maybe explain this? Well, I can, I can give it a try. Yeah, so um, if, you, if you put in m from one to one it's a summation from one to one then you almost get the classical markers only there's then this vibration added but if you go to two then uh, you have such a bell-shaped markers curve but one next to it so it is uh, it is the the m is a summation factor it uh, gives a summation of an exponential function and this uh, this here is like uh, I think it normalizes the contribution of this exponential function. So, um, kijk, uh, how do we put this? Also, in sometimes in uh, if you take a product with an n that increases, so it's an integer. Eh? So m is an integer that increases from one to two to three to four to, in, in principle, to infinity. But if you are at fifteen, then it is. Uh, it has no influence anymore. But this M, what does it really mean? Because you say it's a... No, it's sum, a summation but... factor. It is, the, the M has not got a... Uh, okay, I don't think I can attribute a physical meaning to it, but... It's just a vibrational quantum number. Yeah, it is the, the degree to which this vibrational coupling uh, uh, is important in rate whether it is really the vibrational quantum number, then it is the, the difference in the vibrational quantum number. Eh? So this, the, the one state uh, adds up a lot and then less and less. It's, um, I'm not sure if it is really the vibrational quantum number, but something that is related to that, yeah. Yeah, I actually, uh, that's how I interpret it, because also the graphs that you showed uh, where you have these oscillations, the, yeah. the difference between these oscillations exactly matches the vibrational frequency. Here, in this uh, picture? Uh, no, the, in the pre-recorded lecture also. Oh, okay, 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 yeah. So the, the, the spacing was like uh, 50 on uh, uh, the... the the resonance of the vibrational levels. Yeah. 
So uh, how good do they contribute? And what do these numbers then from one to 15 mean? That means that if you go uh, above 15 or if you go higher and higher, then the overlap becomes negligible. Um, yeah, no, it is, I cannot, I cannot visual. Okay, so I have, uh, I have thought about uh, making an interactive diagram where you can change the delta G, but also including the vibrational wave functions and how this frame condom factor changes. But I've been unable to make that. But basically, if you go higher and higher up here, then uh, the contribution will become smaller and smaller. Maybe do you have a paper that explains this uh, semi-classical Marx theory with the increase of your uh, M? Maybe that will make it a little bit clearer. Yeah, I think that there is one uh, in the extra info. So this, this is this uh, Journal of uh, Theoretical Chemistry and Computation. Okay. We'll look at that, thank you. Yeah, maybe that helps. Okay, so. We have seen that many factors play a role in the classical Marcus theory of electron transfer, and we have tools to make good estimates for them. The complex framework of Marcus, it gives us a handle to predict and to un understand how charges are created and how they decay within molecules and materials under the influence of light. Thank you.